You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 5th, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Diagnostic Evaluation for Inborn Errors of Immunity. Our presenter is Dr. Rashini Abraham. She's the Associate Chief of Academic Affairs and the Founding Director of the Diagnostic Immunology Laboratory in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome back to Conferences for Online Allergy. Today is October the 5th and we are about to start our 11 a.m. lecture. Um, we have with us Dr. Roshni Abraham, um, who is going to be speaking with us today on diagnostic evaluation for inborn errors of immunity. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Abraham. Oh, thank you, Jordan. It's uh, my pleasure. Um, and I look forward to spending the next hour or so with all of you. So um, when Dr. Darling asked me to do this lecture, uh, and asked me to, you know, sort of give an overview on diagnostic immunology, I sort of felt like it wouldn't be one of those leisurely train rides to the countryside where you can look out and, uh, you know, marvel at the scenery. This would be like one of the bullet trains because there's just a huge amount to cover, as all of you can probably appreciate. The field is so vast. Uh, you know, one could spend hours, you know, for our fellows over here, I do about 18 hours of lectures just to cover the diagnostic immunology. So my apologies in advance, you know, if I seem to be hurrying through the material or sort of going through it at a fairly high level, I'm happy to, uh, you know, take more questions, certainly talk to anybody who's interested at a later date, uh, send you papers to read if you're interested. So, so please don't think that, you know, I'm uh, sort of giving you this rush tour and then abandoning you to your own devices. Uh, I'm happy to follow. And you saw that uh, my email uh, is on the previous slide. So, okay. So without further ado, let's get started. So all of you uh, hopefully have seen the 2019 International Union of Immunological Societies classification for primary immunodeficiencies and immune dysregulatory disorders. A couple of cycles ago, this, uh, this classification comes out every two years. So it was published in the Journal of Clinical Immunology in 2020, January. Um, and uh, the next one will be two years hence. But a couple of cycles ago, they decided to sort of omit the designation uh, primary immunodeficiencies and rather use this all-encompassing term inborn errors of immunity. So I, I've, you know, I still say PIDs uh, when casually talking, but whenever now I formally write something, I always write it out as inborn errors of immunity. And so in that version of the classification, there are about 427 monogenic disorders of the immune system listed there, along with uh, the table nine, which is the phenocopies of inborn errors of immunity. So these are not genetic disorders. These are usually caused by autoantibodies, to key immunological proteins, but they actually phenotypically mimic the menogenic disorders. So, so they've been sort of in, in, uh, folded into this classification. It's been, well, what, nine months or so since that paper came out, and we already have 30 new gene defects since uh, was published. So there's going to be an interim report that's going to come out uh, with these new genetic defects because otherwise, you know, it'll be waiting for two years for the next classification. So you can see that maybe a decade or uh, a decade and a half ago, we had only four categories or four tables. We had B-cell defects, T-cell defects, uh, the combined immunodeficiencies and the phagocytic disorders. Um, and complement, you know, so those were the four major categories, adaptive, innate, 
complement. Um, and so now we've become far more granular. We've, you know, got these primary immune dysregulatory disorders of the birds, and we've got the primary immunodeficiencies where infection is the major phenotype. So if you haven't uh, seen this paper, I would recommend uh, you take a look. And there's a counterpart, which is the phenotypic classification from the IUIS, and that was also published in the same issue in January of this year. So there are many different ways that we wind up encountering and diagnosing patients with inborn areas of immunity in this year. Uh, you know, we still have patients who have a predominant infection phenotype. But our thinking has certainly broadened, and we no longer think that a defect in the immune system basically means there's an infection susceptibility. Because sometimes you diagnose patients who've got unusual or early or multiple autoimmunity. So that sort of falls under the primary immune regulatory disorders, so the PIDs and the PIRDs. And then some patients are picked up by a laboratory phenotype when they're being tested for something else. And usually the IgA subclass deficiency, you know, the selective IgA deficiency, some of the IgG subclasses, and certainly other inborn areas of immunity can also be diagnosed through a means of just laboratory testing when you're trying to follow um, a clue uh, for a patient who's presenting with a phenotype where for whatever reason you may not have a high suspicion of an underlying monogenic defect. And then of course besides the uh, sort of classic monogenic immune deficiencies, we've got the syndromic disorders where the immune deficiency is one aspect of a broader constellation of organ systems and phenotypes. And so, you know, ataxia, telangiectasia, DeGeorge syndrome, Traub syndrome, you know, all of those could come under this condition of syndromic. And we certainly, while we're making and adding new monogenic defects to our total list, you know, several of them are these syndromic disorders. And then, of course, some patients have a family history, so they are picked up fairly early. And then now with genomics becoming such a common tool, more easily accessible. Uh, some patients, you know, they get a, a genomics analysis fairly early on, which might seem and which might be a fishing expedition uh, sometimes, but sometimes it might yield some fruit. But there's confounders in all of these diagnoses. So I've written 416 here, but it's 427. And then if you add the 430 new defects in the last six months or so, uh, we're well over 450 now, and uh, that itself is extraordinarily challenging, you know, and particularly for AI fellows who are getting out into practice and, you know, your practice may be largely A, then I, it's in, almost impossible to keep track of all of this. Um, the other is that you have inborn errors of immunity where you've got susceptibility to a single microorganism. So the Mendelian susceptibility to microbacterial disease, you've got about nine defects there. You've got susceptibility to EBV, you've got uh, several defects over there, susceptibility to HPV, uh, to mucocutaneous candidiasis. So you name it. Uh, you know, there's a, a given phenotype and multiple genetic um, uh, defects that go along with that phenotype. And then, as I mentioned, you know, our cha the change in paradigm in thinking about immune dysregulation uh, under this umbrella of inborn areas of immunity where, you know, immune dysregulation, autoimmunity, susceptibility to malignancy is the key phenotype rather than infection. And then, of course, there are modulators. I've listed one modulator here, somatic mosaicism, uh, which can modulate the phenotype. But you can have, you know, variable expressivity. You can have incomplete penetrance. You can have diagenic uh, inborn errors of immunity. Uh, you can have arthritic uh, modifiers. So there's a lot that can modulate the phenotype. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on.
And then, of course, you've got what we call the two-hit hypothesis, in that you've got an underlying germline defect, you chug along for a period of time where you might not have a phenotype, and then, boom, you get a second hit, which could be an infection or something, and then that phenotype sort of dramatically manifests itself. And the X-linked lymphoproliferative disease due to mutations in the gene encoding the SAP protein, the SLAM-associated protein, is a classic example where the patient's phenotype becomes apparent as a result of an EBV infection. And then we talked, uh, you know, in the previous slide about phenocopies. And we're certainly not going to get into that because that itself is a talk. Um, so the point I just want to make here, particularly as fellows going out into practice, some of you may choose a half and half, some may be more allergy than immunology, some may be vice versa. And it's almost impossible to do this field justice without, you know, giving your life to it. But, you know, a decade or two decades ago, you know, we had a very linear sort of concept about what in born areas of immunity or primary immunodeficiencies where we thought a single gene, we've got a phenotype, and that's the end of that. And now our current understanding is more like a Jackson Pollock painting over on the right-hand side. It's just a mishmash because we've got multiple genetic defects that can give rise to the same phenotype. We've got so many modulators of that phenotype. But we don't have a black and white correlation that we can perform any longer. We have to have a broad differential very often. And we get a molecular diagnosis and we say, OK, these are the phenotypes. You know, in will come another patient who looks somewhat different from that. And you have to then start expanding your phenotypic bucket. So what are the reasons why we are trying so hard to make an early diagnosis because, you know, on average, you know, it can take a few years to sometimes a decade or longer uh, and the diagnostic odyssey can be very prolonged for patients with complicated immune phenotypes. Uh, it's certainly, you know, we do have patients who seem straightforward, but we have many patients who are not straightforward and we still have to attempt rather vigorously to try and make a diagnosis. Because making a conclusive diagnosis means being able to put, if possible, a gene defect with a phenotype and then looking at all the downstream results of having a gene defect or a name for the disease. Because you can then describe what the genetic etiology is. In some cases, uh, knowing what the molecular variant is allows you to predict disease severity to prognosticate a bit, you can look into your toolbox and say, do I have more to offer than, you know, standard antibiotics, immunoglobulin, uh, or even bone marrow transplant, or do I have other things to offer? And then, of course, as we talked about, you know, complex phenotypes means we're getting into other factors that can modulate a mon monogenic disorder, you know, what are the risk factors or what other disease or genetic associations can modulate the phenotype. And then, of course, you know, we need to do counselling because if you are looking at a monogenic disorder that's germline, then you have to sort of be able to calculate heritable risk. And then, of course, uh, you know, it's exactly 10 and a half years now uh, since we've had newborn screening for an immune uh, disorder uh, for SCID, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And tough as it is sometimes to make the genotype-phenotype correlations, we still um, do that when possible because it gives us a starting place to come up with a differential diagnosis. And then, of course, we've had to expand our genotype-phenotype correlations from the time the first defect was described. But that doesn't mean we've stopped, <coughs> excuse me, stopped doing that. And then, of course, it's all about improving outcomes, improving survival. And so all of these hopefully give you a persuasive reason to have early diagnosis of these disorders. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, I did send a PDF version of this talk to Miranda, so you can certainly get that from her.
Uh, I would appreciate it if you don't broadly circulate it, but just use it for your own reference. Uh, so this is just a simple little thing that you can even print out and you know keep at your desk. Um, just a handy little clinical key to when do you think about uh, these disorders in terms of buckets, you know, based on uh, some simple clinical phenotype. Of course, you know, everything I've said before tells you that there's obviously far more complex manifestations, and I'm not trying to diminish that uh, by trying to simplify it to this, but I think it gives you a starting place. So now, uh, from uh, since I'm a diagnostic immunologist, I really want to focus on, you know, what are the diagnostic tools available today, and how different it is even from a few years ago uh, in terms of what we have in the clinical domain and the research domain. So flow cytometry is, of course, a fundamental tool that we have. Uh, we use it to quantify, we use it to qualify, to look qualitatively at subsets. We look at to use it to look, drill down deep into the T cell, B cell, NK compartments and do really complex immunophenotyping. But we can also do a variety of functional assays, which I'll uh, give you some examples of. But then we've also got immunoassays because we've got a number of soluble biomarkers and proteins that we have to detect from, you know, the simplest end of the spectrum, your immunoglobulins, which we quantitate with by nephilometry to, you know, cytokines and inflammatory markers. And all of those are done by immunoassays. Now, I obviously don't have time to talk to you about the methodology and the principle of some of these. Um, I do understand from our fellows that uh, this year's in-service exam, I don't know if that's a national thing or not, but uh, they, there were a number of questions on immunoassays, so I would definitely encourage you to read up on it um, because it might come in for handy for your exams. And then, of course, we do a variety of cellular studies using different tools. It could go from cell culture, it could feed back into flow, uh, and so on. And then we do molecular analysis that is non-genetic, you know, so where we're not looking at the uh, DNA of the genome, but rather we're looking at other markers using molecular tools. For example, TREC. T cell receptor excision circles or interferon stimulated gene signature for patients with auto inflammatory conditions. So we use, remember, these are all tools, just like other specialties use a multiplicity of tools. We also use all of these, but of course, they're tailored and designed uh, for us to look at patients with immune disorders. Now we've got our genetic and chromosomal analysis where we are looking for heritable disorders uh, of the immune system. And then, you know, some of these are definitely validated and in the clinical domain where a physician can, you know, click a button and order the test and you get a report in your EMR. And then there are several complex assays that have not yet been transitioned over into the clinical setting. They are still available in research labs. And so, you know, you have to still use some of these, but clinicians should be aware of, you know, what the difference between research and clinical tests, uh, that some are, you know, really stringently validated and meet all the regulatory guidelines, whereas many research tests are not, but you still sometimes have to use it to tease out some complex patients. So I just want to now go through a journey of giving you some examples that would cover, you know, different aspects of the T cells, B cells, innate immunity, complement, and so on. So I think this uh, newborn screening represents a significant milestone, really a coup for our field, because it took, you know, probably four decades to persuade uh, the, because newborn screening has been, is 57 years old as a public initiative, 
And uh, since the early 70s, there's been a push uh, to incorporate SCID as part of the recommended uniform screening panel, but nobody was buying it except, you know, for us in our field. And then in 2010, that tide turned and it was added to the RUSP. And then over the course of the next nine years, as of December 2018, all 50 states and the territory of Puerto Rico and the Navajo Nation all are doing newborn screening for skin. So quite remarkable. And then not only our country, but, you know, some provinces in Canada, uh, countries outside, so all the way from Australia, New Zealand, Asia, uh, probably not but South America, Europe, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so definitely people are looking at newborn screening for picking up skid and severe T cell lymphopenia. Now, there's a push in some countries to look for severe B cell immunodeficiency disorders as well, using the B cell equivalent of the T cell receptor excision circle called the CREC. And in the United States, we have not yet added it to our, our uniform screening panel because the evidence is still inconclusive about the utility of doing CREC uh, at the newborn screening level. And also now, uh, TREC was the first molecular assay uh, that entered the newborn screening domain. And now, of course, we've got CREC and spinal muscular atrophy. Those three tests are often multiplexed together uh, and therefore you know, CREC is not uh, entered the mainstream in the United States. Uh, I'm leading a committee uh, for the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute. In 2013, we published a document on newborn screening for SCID using TREC. Uh, we are currently working on a revision of that document, which will be published in December 2021, where we are talking about harmonizing TREC across the United States and across the globe and also about the utility of adding CREC for severe B-cell immunodeficiencies. So one of the challenges, so great, we've implemented newborn screening for square TREC, kudos to everybody, but the challenge remains is that we are not all talking the same language. We have different interpretive cutoffs uh, for each state, We've got uh, different algorithms uh, whereby we do different kinds of testing and so on and so forth. So, so we're not uniform in our practices of how we handle an abnormal newborn screen result. And so part of the rationale of this new Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute document is to actually try and get people all together on the same page, which, believe me, if you know anything about immunologists, it's like herding cats. But anyway, we're trying to do that with this document. And we've offered, you know, our, this committee's perspective of how to handle those, how to harmonize. So we're saying if you've got a term infant, you either have a low TREC or a completely absent TREC. And on the basis of that, you take the low TREC and you go and do your lymphocyte immunophenotyping. And we're definitely saying that you just can't look at TB and K quantitation. You have to look at naive memory or recent time mechanic rinse right off the bat. That's normal. That's fine. You leave that be. If it's abnormal, then you have to do the appropriate follow-up test, clinical evaluation, and so on and so forth. Now, if you have a term infant with completely undetectable trick, then that has to be absolutely urgent. And we want clinicians to understand the difference between the two, uh, you know, the low TREC and the undetectable TREC. So that's why we're kind of drawing attention that this is absolutely urgent to do this analysis ASAP. Now, we are dealing with these issues as well. Uh, every state lab is dealing with that, and that is you've got infants in the NICU, they're either term with low birth weight or preterm and or low birth weight. And again, you wind up with a scenario of having either undetectable TREC or low TREC. And so again, 
If you've got a preterm infant with low birth weight who is low trach, then you repeat your dried blood spot sampling, you repeat your trach analysis at the adjusted gestational age of 37 weeks or 1500 grams birth weight, and then you follow that pathway. On the other hand, whether you've got a NICU term infant who's low birth weight or a NICU preterm or low birth weight, if they're undetectable trach, then all pathways converge here in terms of absolute urgency of doing the follow-up testing. So this has come as a result of, you know, several clinicians on the committee, several public health screening labs on the committee, and, you know, it's obviously been a back and forth process through this year, and this algorithm is as a result of that. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually seen flow data uh, for an abnormal newborn screen for SCID, uh, but this is the TBNK, which I would call, you know, next to CBC is a bread and butter test uh, for most immunologists, quantitation of the three main lymphocyte subsets. So you have your CD45 positive lymphocytes here. Uh, in my lab and in my lab, former lab at the Mayo Clinic, I've been here only for two years. So for many years, I was at Mayo. And I developed the assay. I incorporated CD14 because I wanted to make sure that I was excluding any monocytes that might creep into my lymphocyte gate, which would then actually show up in my NK cell population. So I do want to aberrantly boost my NK cell count by dragging in some monocytes unbeknown. And you can see, if I go directly from here to doing all this analysis, you can see that I have some monocytes in this gate. And the only way I'm able to discriminate that is by including this 14 versus 4 to 5, because now I've got my clean lymphocyte population. I can take this forward, look at CD3, and then take my CD3, look at 4 and 8, go to my CD3, uh, sorry, take my CD3, look at 4 and 8, and take my CD3 negative and look at 19 versus NK, B versus NK. So that's my first TBNK. But as I mentioned, we have been emphasizing through the Clinical Immunology Society, we published a paper in the International Journal of Neonatal Screening saying that you just can't have a TBNK as your first screen. You need to incorporate some markers for naive and memory T cells. And so what you're seeing here is RA and RO, so you're looking at your naive RA positive T cells. In an infant, you don't expect many memory T cells at that age, so you won't see that, and then you've got this transitional population. And then many labs have additional markers because you can have uh, memory cells that re-express RA in certain clinical contexts. We call them TEMRA cells, T effector memory expressing RA. So you want to be sure that these uh, cells that are RA positive are actually true naive thymic derived. So you can look at CD31 positive recent thymic emigrants or you can incorporate CCR7, CD62L, you know, that can vary from lab to lab. So this is what um, a normal healthy infant would look like. So here's an example of an infant who uh, has an IL-7 receptor alpha skid, so it's a T minus, B plus, NK plus, so you, one thing is pretty apparent. Uh, apparent. Uh, first of all, there are lots of dead cells. So you see this big blob here. Uh, you've got a lot of dead cells. You have very few lymphocytes um, right here in this gate. So anyway, you go through that process, and one thing is dramatically apparent. Your CD3 positive T cells are really down in the pits. You've only got 7%, whereas uh, normally it can be anywhere from 50 to 80%. And then you look at 4 versus 8s. There's absolutely no 8s. There are a few CD4s there uh, in a leaky format. And then if you start looking at the naive versus memory, what you see is no naive, pure naive, no pure memory. You have a bunch of these transitional cells and there are no recent thymic emicrines. So it doesn't take a genius here 
to say that, you know, th this is very concerning for SCID and, you know, you need to go on to a, a genetic panel to identify the type of SCID. Uh, now, in many cases, and particularly the primary immunodeficiency treatment consortium, PIDTC, they mandate some form of functional testing before a patient is taken to transplant. So, as all of you may be familiar, uh, one of the common T-cell functional assays that is used and available in the clinical lab is looking at proliferation to mitogens. And we use it in many different contexts, certainly in the importance of immunity, but we also use it broadly to assess T-cell function in other secondary immune uh, disorders, whether it's due to medication, whether it's due to infection, whatever that might be. And uh, particularly now, as we're using more and more biological therapies, as well as, you know, drugs like mycophenolate, uh, azathioprine, all of which inhibit T-cell proliferation, then sometimes it's helpful to assess that. And then, of course, we use it in the BMT setting to look at recovery of functional competence um, post-transplant. But we're now also using it in our solid organ transplant patients, particularly those who've got uh, chronic EBV, viremia, etc., who are not, you know, um, falling into a nice, neat sort of follow-up post-solid uh, organ transplant. Now, there are many different ways of assessing T-cell function uh, proliferation. The old-fashioned traditional method was to use a radioactive dye that incorporates, you know, chelates, um, intercalates into the DNA of proliferating cells, and then you measure the amount of radiation, which is equivalent to the amount of proliferation. Many labs, uh, and when I was at Mayo almost a decade ago, I decided that, you know, that assay was too uh, insensitive, uh, particularly in patients with lymphopenia, and uh, kind of a blind method. It was like looking at stars with the binoculars versus a telescope and expecting, you know, good resolution. So I went to this EDU-based uh, dye to, for, uh, and using flow cytometry. So EDU is a bromodeoxyuridine type of analog, which again, like thymidine, is incorporated into the DNA of proliferating cells. And then you can label that in a copper catalyzed reaction with a fluorescent molecule, which can be detected by flow. So the good thing about flow is when you take uh, cells, so these are cells which have not been stimulated, you can immediately, you know, see what is background proliferation because you can visualize these cells. And then, of course, you can add specific markers to look at total lymphocytes using CD4 to 5, using CD3 for T cells, using CD19 for B cells, and so on. So now when you add something like PHA, you see in the previous slide, you had most of your lymphocytes in resting state in this button here. And the moment you now put a stimulant, you see the buttons gone. And you see a big increase in these cells with high granularity and size based on the side scatter, which tells you these are proliferating cells. And then you can actually read it out as a histogram and say, you know, what percent of my total lymphocytes are proliferating? What percent of my total T cells are proliferating? And there are some clear advantages. One is you can actually visualize everything that's going on, where with the radioactive method, you're flying blind. The other is that this particular dye is more stable uh, particularly in clinical labs where you have high volume of testing and you're assessing gain of signal rather than loss of signal. Whereas in CFSE, you're labeling your cells and you're looking at dilution of the signal with every round of proliferation. Whereas the EDU, like thymidine, you know, you let the cells proliferate uh, for three days and then you add your dye and then give it 18 hours to incorporate into the DNA, and then you measure that. And the most important is this number three for me, which is uh, discriminating between normal and abnormal T-cell function, particularly in patients with T-cell lymphopenia who have cellular dilution. And I'm happy to explain this more to anybody who has any questions.
So that sort of gives you a bird's eye view of some of the tests we use for the T cell response and to look at um, some basic immune screening post uh, for newborn screening. So now I'm just getting a little bit into the antibody responses. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, we have different types of antibody responses. So the most common antibody response that we think about with protein-based vaccines or protein-conjugate vaccines are T-dependent antibody responses. But we also have T-independent antibody responses, and we've got now three subcategories in T-independent responses. We've got T-independent type 1, type 2, type 3. And so pneumococcal antibody, for example, falls into the T-independent type 2 because you've got this repetitive polysaccharide structure. The T-independent type 2 is usually microbial uh, ligands like lipopolysaccharide, um, where you get mainly IgM antibodies and you don't get T-cell hair. Now, in the T-independent type 2, which is like pneumococcal or meningococcal polysaccharide, we do get... Uh, IgG and IgM and for many years till about eight years ago it was a mystery how we were making IgG antibodies uh, to a T independent antigen and then the uh, definitive study that came out from Dr. Andrea Ciruti's lab showed that there were actually B helper neutrophils in the marginal zone of the lymphoid follicles, and they were secreting cytokines that allowed these B cells to undergo class switching. So that, you know, changed the whole complexion of things, you know, and showed that there is so much of a crosstalk between our innative and adaptive immune responses. And we never thought that neutrophils would actually help B cells uh, with antibody production and isotype class switching. So very interesting paper. Uh, and then, of course, you know, with your standard T-dependent independent protein antigens, you have your germinal center response, you need your follicular T-healthy cells, you form good memory response, uh, and so on. So that's your, you know, sort of standard. And here are just some examples for you. Again, I'm not going to go over each one of these in detail. You can go to the PDF version of this uh, to refresh your memory if you need to. So very quickly, in the case of the <clears throat> T-independent, like if you've got a polysaccharide antigen, they can bind these marginal zone cells. So these marginal zone, cell, marginal zone cells are 19 positive, CD19 positive, CD27 positive, IgM positive, IgD positive. This is in contrast to your class switch memory B cells, which are 19 positive, 27 positive, M minus, D minus. So these marginal zone B cells are also called non-switch memory B cells. Now, in very young children, infants, you have uh, fewer numbers of marginal zone B cells, which is why it's been thought, you know, they won't respond well to polysaccharide vaccines, though there's data that's been reported out of studies from Australia, from New Zealand, that actually babies as young as six months can uh, respond to polysaccharide vaccines, though our current practice is not to give polysaccharide vaccines to children less than two years of age. And then these marginal zone B cells can uh, proliferate and differentiate into short-lived, low-affinity antibody-producing plasma cells. And as I told you, they can recruit the help of these B helper neutrophils in the lymphoid follicles and uh, go, they undergo isotype class switching and make IgG antibodies as well. The other thing in children, in very young children, uh, it, it's thought that they have lower levels of CD21 and TACI, and therefore, you know, they don't get the same robust response to polysaccharide. And I think to some extent this, this concept has been challenged with newer studies. Now, on the other hand, if you've got a protein antigen, your classic T-dependent antigen, 
then normally what you would have is you'd recruit your follicular dendritic cells to help the antigen present to help the T cells. You would form a germinal center. You would undergo somatic hypermutation, isotype class switching, and then you would either commit to being a memory B cell or a cell producing high affinity antibody, you'd home back and into niches in the bone marrow and keep producing the antibody. And so it's thought that, you know, very young infants, again, don't have a very strong follicular dendritic cell a network. They also uh, have lower co-stimulatory molecules like CD40 ligand, uh, CD80, CD86, and therefore don't have as robust an immune response. So um, I'll, I'll just leave that uh, over there with regard to the antibody response. Now, I very just very briefly want to touch upon as an immunoassay technology we use to look at pneumococcal antibody responses. There are different assays that people use. Um, there are ELISA-based methods for pneumococcal that's considered the gold standard. But there are my former lab at Mayo used to we use this luminex based technology uh, basically you've got a hundred beads of different colors as you can see and so each of these beads is unique so basically you can look at a hundred different analytes at the same time because you can conjugate each bead to something that you want to detect and the instrument and the software can read, oh, this is bead one, and it is conjugated to uh, antigen X, and this is bead 100, and it's conjugated to antigen Y. So basically, then what you're doing is it's a type of flow cytometry, because you take these beads, which have been conjugated to your 23 pneumococcal polysaccharides, you incubate it with uh, your patient serum, which has antibody, they bind to the beads, and then you detect that antibody by a secondary antibody, which is conjugated to a fluorescent molecule, and you read the amount of fluorescence, and you create a standard curve, and you say there's X amount of uh, antibody to serotype A or B or C in the patient's serum. Now, uh, this whole thing about pneumococcal antibodies and how to interpret the data is a talk in itself, so I'm not going to get sidetracked with that. I just wanted to give you an example of a methodology. So on one end, you know, some labs use the ELISA-based method, and they have 23 different, you know, wells coated for the 23 different polysaccharides, and here's a sort of flow-based method for multiplex detection of many different polysaccharides. So I'm going to now switch from B to NK cells and very quickly go over NK cell function. So in blood, we have two main flavors of NK cells. About 90% of our circulating NK cells are this flavor, the cytotoxic NK cells. They have high expression of the CD16 molecule. We call them CD16 bright. And they're dim for this uh, NCAM molecule, CD56. And they're really good at killing. On the other hand, you've got 10% uh, of your circulating NK cells of this flavor we call them 56 bright 16 plus minus and they really produce a lot of different cytokines and not as effective as killing these are considered more mature these are considered more mature nk cells so how do we measure nk function so nk cells are different from t cells and b cells even though they are lymphocytes they have certain pre-configured receptors and so they have uh, activating receptors, they've got inhibitory receptors. And so normally when they see a target cell, if that target cell is expressing MHC class 1 or HLA A, B and C, which are MHC class 1 in humans, the inhibitory receptor will recognize that and it will stop the activation of the NK cell dead in its tracks and it'll say, no, you should not be killing this cell. 
On the other hand, if you've got a virally infected target cell, then the MC class 1 is down-regulated, so there's nothing for the inhibitory receptor to recognize and put the brakes on the system. So the accelerator pedal is turned on because this activation uh, receptor recognizes an appropriate ligand on the target cell, and that tells the NK cell this is a good target to kill, and it will release its cytotoxic granules that will kill the target cell. So in the clinical lab, uh, what we use is we use a cell line derived from a myelomonocytic leukemia called K562. That cell line does not express MHC class 1, so it's a great way to take the patient's PBMCs or peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which contain NK cells, and use that labeled a target. It could be labeled with radioactivity or it could be labeled with a fluorescent marker and then you can use it for killing. Now, we do not really ask people to order this assay much anymore because it's a very, very sensitive labile assay. It, uh, you know, on ship samples, you get a lot of background um, uh, which looks abnormal, you know, for cytotoxic activity. And, you know, some perfectly healthy people also look like they have lay cytotoxicity. So its specificity and sensitivity are really, specificity is excellent, but sensitivity is very low. So what people prefer to measure now, uh, particularly for HLH and other disorders where you're looking at aberrant NK cell activation, is to look at uh, this CD107 A and B, also called LAMP1 and LAMP2, lysosomal associated membrane protein 1 and 2. So basically you've got your NK or CD8 cell, you've got these granules with cytotoxic proteins in there, and this, these molecules are expressed on the surface of these cytotoxic granules. When the cell gets activated, this granule will start moving towards the cell membrane, and it will fuse with the cell membrane, allowing what was previously intracellular to now become extracellular or on the surface. So you can do flow cytometry, cell surface flow cytometry, and measure the amount of CD107 on the surface, which gives you the marker for degranulation or the marker for NK cell activation or CD8 cytotoxic T cell activation. So this is what people recommend more nowadays than the previous assay uh, because of its low sensitivity. Okay, so that's TB and NK. And now very quickly, uh, in the next 10 minutes, I just want to quickly go over some innate immune uh, uh, overview. So with regard to neutrophils, which are our absolute first responders uh, for the immune system, we've got three main different methods of killing. We've got the NADPH oxidase pathway. We've got different proteases that are contained with the neutrophil granules. And then we've got this net, uh, net formation or these extracellular traps where you've got extrusion of DNA out of the neutrophils, and these sort of act like tentacles, and they can capture pathogen and bring it back inside the neutrophils. We're just going to focus for now on the NADPH oxidase way. Uh, as I told you, there are lots of different uh, cytotoxic proteins inside the granules, and there are different types of granules inside the neutrophil. These are the three main types of granules, and these are the different contents that you find there. And in addition, you have the NADPH oxidase pathway, which in a simple uh, sort of say, sense when they're activated in presence of the appropriate signal, which could be a bacterium or a pathogen, then you ultimately have act activation of this pathway producing hypohalous acid and hydrogen peroxide. So basically you've got bleach. And this process requires another protein besides the NADPH oxidase components, which is myeloperoxidase. I'll talk about that in a minute. So you've got basically five key components of the NADPH oxidase. Two of them are membrane-bound, and one of them is glycosylated. 
So this is the most common form associated with X-linked CGD. All of these are autosomal recessively inherited forms of CGD encoding these other proteins. So I just want to show you some of the patterns because when you order the flow cytometry test to assess neutrophil oxidative births, it's very important that the lab you send it to knows how to interpret those results because there's a lot of pattern recognition and being able to distinguish what is normal and what the underlying genetic defect might be. So PMA or fourfold myristate acetate is the most common um, a stimulant used to activate neutrophils and so here you've got uh, unactivated or resting neutrophils and when you activate them you can see nice uh, positive peak uh, because this shows that there's NADPH oxidase activity you're measuring the conversion of a non-fluorescent dirhodamine 123 to dihydrorhodamine 123 which is a fluorescent so here's a patient with classic X-linked CGD where the stimulated and unstimulated peaks perfectly overlap, superimpose. There's absolutely not even a whisper of an oxidative burst. Here's a patient with P4 to 7 FOX autosomal recessive CGD. This is one of the classic patterns where you see some amount of oxidative burst in a subset of neutrophils, but it's very dim relative to where you would typically expect to see it. This is a patient with P67 autosomal recessive uh, CGD. You see a similar pattern. Now this, interestingly enough, is a patient with complete myeloperoxidase deficiency. And I want you to take a look at A versus E. And if you notice that what's the difference between A and D, uh, you see a complete shift, so you don't see this partial, you know, overlap. It's clearly different from the unstimulated. The big difference is the amount of fluorescence is very low compared to a normal situation. Now, the P40 Fox type of autosomal recessive CGD will look exactly like this. And so the only way for you to discriminate is I'll show you in the next couple of slides. Now, here's a patient that I looked at for patient I um, myeloperoxidase deficiency or was one of those rare P40 FOX. And so I did genetic testing and it turned out to be a patient with a hypomorphic X-linked CGD. So this is a classic null X-linked CGD and this is a hypomorphic X-linked CGD. This is a female. Uh, carrier of X-linked CGD, and she had age-related skewed linization in her neutrophils, resulting in a phenotype that looked exactly like the classic male X-linked CGD. So this is a 65-year-old female with pseudomonas pneumonia, and this was her oxidative burst. She didn't always look like this, but as she got older, she had age-related skiing of linization. Now, as clinicians, what I strongly recommend when you order these tests is to communicate with the lab during the testing. Because if you use a terrible sample, you're going to get a terrible result if you can't interpret. So this is what a good sample would look like. You've got a nice fat cluster of neutrophils. You've got a clear separation, no double peaks, no overlaps, this and that. It looks as crisp as can be. And here's a sample of a perfectly healthy individual that was uh, 48 hours after collection that was transported under less than optimal conditions. You see a lot of dead neutrophils, very few viable neutrophils, as a result of which you first see this broad peak with the green, you're unstimulated, and then you see two peaks for your stimulated. And this confuses many people as to how to interpret. But this is a perfectly healthy individual whose sample was just horrible and as a result gave you this sort of ambiguous um, oxidative burst uh, phenotype. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing that I have, um, uh, I started in my lab and which I will be offering clinically uh, in a year's time, I've already done the development, I'm starting validation, 
is actually to do a rapid uh, triage to un identify what the genetic defect might be by looking by flow cytometry at the specific NADPH oxidase protein. So here I, is the DHR result, and here I'm looking at each individual protein. So the, here's the GP91 associated with X-linked CGD. Here are the three autosomal recessive. I haven't uh, shown you the P67. We can do exactly the same thing. The only one that doesn't work as well is the P40 Fox. And the P40 Fox autosomal recessive CGD is actually very rare. And you can look at it both in neutrophils and monocytes. So this gives you a really quick triage as to what the underlying genetic defect might be. But this is also very helpful in characterizing variants of uncertain significance in any of these genes, particularly in this gene, uh, P47 Fox NCF1, which has a pseudogene and is not, uh, many labs don't have good genetic testing. Uh, the flow-based assay can tell you if you're looking at a patient with P4 to 7 folks. Now, uh, the picture I showed you with those five different subunits have been traditionally considered the five genetic de defects for CGD. And about a year or two ago, another genetic defect was added due to mutations in this gene CYCB1 encoding this protein EROS. And you can see that uh, stimulation with either zymosin or with PMA, it significantly decreased in the patient compared to the control. So now you've got to broaden your genetic uh, capture a little bit uh, because now you've got a new mutation that's not directly part of the NADPH oxidase subunits, but affects the NADPH oxidase activity and gives you a low DHR result. And so if you recall, I showed you a flow plot like this, and I showed you that uh, there's, um, you know, partial uh, neutrophil oxidative burst in these patients with P40 Fox deficiency. And this is the patient with complete myeloperoxidase deficiency. So this is what the normal would look like if it was an X-linked CGD, completely null, it would overlap with the green, and the CMPO uh, is sort of in between. And the way to confirm do a staining for myeloperoxidase in a smear of neutrophils and you can see that compared to the control of the parents, the patient, uh, the female, these are two siblings, um, she has absolutely no myeloperoxidase, he has just a little bit. Um, so then very quickly going on to another aspect of innate immunity is looking at integrins. So integrins are like uh, chemotactic or ke chemical GPS signals that tell leukocytes where to go in the setting of an insult of an inflammatory response. And so for leukocyte adhesion deficiency, which is a classic inborn error of immunity affecting the integrin pathway, we look at the expression of this beta-2 integrin CD18 on neutrophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes, and we look at its partners because this forms homodimers or heterodimers with these other integrins, CD11A, CD11B. So this is what a healthy control would look like. The red is the isotype and the blue is the specifically stained, and you see that in a healthy control you've got all these proteins. Whereas in a patient with uh, LAD type 1, you see the blue is either overlapping with the red or less than the red uh, for everything except CD11B in neutrophils, which you can see that uh, even in patients with leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So all of these strongly suggest LAD type 1, and then it can be confirmed um, with genetic testing. And of course, these patients have cellulitis and so on with absence of pus. Now, going on to the last one before I finish up uh, is complement defects. And I'm just going to speed it up a bit because I'm running out of time. Um, but these are the settings in which you would assess for complement defects. Uh, you've got my PDF, so I'm not going to take more time on it. This was an excellent review article that came out uh, in the Journal of Clinical Immunology. You can look at it. I've just made a chart out of this, and it just tells you the three major pathways, the classical pathway, 
the alternate pathway and the lectin pathway, and that you can assess for each of those. And if those are aberrant, then you can look at individual components that are critical for those pathways. You can also look for activation markers of complement because that will allow you to differentiate between consumption of complement due to immune complex formation or poor sample collection versus having a monogenic defect in one of these um, complement pathway uh, components. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind as a clinician when you send testing for complements is that, you know, there are a number of factors that can affect uh, the complement result testing. And so you should ideally repeat an abnormal result to make sure that it is a correct and reproducible finding. And you should know some of the concerns, uh, pre-analytical concerns that can affect complement results. Now, very quickly about genetic testing, because that is part and parcel of the armamentarium for evaluating newborn, um, sorry, inborn errors of immunity. And now, of course, you know, we've got so many choices, right? We've got targeted panels with 400 plus genes. We've got whole exome. We've got whole genome. And these are clinically available. Uh, transcriptome RNA sequencing is not yet routinely clinical available broadly. Some labs offer some limited versions, but there are certain settings in which um, you would want to use one or the other. And I think the slides are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to take time to go over it. The bottom line is that, you know, there are... Uh, it makes sense to use a sort of systematic approach. There are certain contexts in which it makes sense to do a targeted panel first and then go on to whole exome and whole genome. In other situations, it may make sense to go right straight here or here, depending on whether you meet some of these criteria. And again, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go over it because I've written it out for you. And we have a couple of review articles. There's a review article coming out in Jackie in practice called The Holy Trinity, uh, written by Dr. But Manish Butte and I. We address these issues, and I'm writing another article that will come out in December uh, on NGS for PIDs. Um, when you order genetic testing for PID genes or inborn errors of immunity, you've got to understand and know those genes a little bit so you can know which test to pick and what the limitations are of the test that you order. Because if you order, uh, you know, if you're suspecting NEMO deficiency or an NCF1 CGD, you have to be sure because most tests don't end. Uh, uh, you know, look for this, they have to have specific tests that look at these genes separately. So something to keep in mind. And ultimately, you have to put it all into context. You've got your clinical phenotype, you've got your genetic results, then you've got your functional testing, and you've got to put all the pieces of the puzzle to get um, a full diagnosis. And so in conclusion, it is a vast and complex field, and, you know, this one-hour bullet train ride, you know, certainly, hopefully, has given you a taste for it, but it certainly does not do it justice. We've got monogenic, digenic, and possibly polygenic disorders, and uh, the disorders allow us to study the human immune system, and it allows us to correlate when we look at targeted biological agents that we use for cancer or other diseases, we also have patients that might have that particular pathway knocked out and we know what sort of side effects or consequences there are. We have lots of diagnostic tools, but we have to use them in the right way for making an accurate and timely diagnosis. The other thing is, you know, everybody is jumping on the genomic bandwagon, and that's great. You can do the genomic testing, but you have to remember that you may not always have a molecular diagnosis, and sometimes you have to manage the patient on a clinical and immunological diagnosis. But where you do have a molecular diagnosis, you can use targeted therapies. But very often you have to verify your genomic data with functional and immunophenotypic studies. And I think if there's one message you would take away, talk to the lab with complex immune diseases to ensure that you're using the right tests at the right time.
to the right patient. Thanks very much and sorry for going over. They may be just trying to take it all in, Dr. Abraham. That was an I awesome. know, I know. You know what? Um, it, it, what I would suggest is, just because I had to go so super fast, uh, is you ask Miranda for the PDF, uh, just review it, and you've got my email address on the first slide. Uh, reach out to me. If you want to talk to me, I'll find time to talk uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one with you guys. Um, if you have questions, you want to email, I'll email you back because it's just a complicated uh, area, you know, and in one hour, you know, you're just rushing like a madcap, so it's very hard to digest. Um, do you want to do that? I think that sounds great. I think that'd be okay. a great idea. Okay, so yeah, so feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions, but uh, thanks very much for your time and attention. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. It was great to have you talk today. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.